Hi everyone. Um, so, wow, it's, there's so many of you here, which is amazing. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, so as Rosaria said, I'm one of the radiology trainees um, at Guys St. Thomas's, and I'm going to be doing this talk on chest x-rays. Just to start, just so you guys know, it is, it is using Kahoot's format. So um, I'm gonna have to ask, um if before we start that you guys kind of log in so you can um use the pin that's available there um we're gonna have a talk probably for about kind of 15 to 20 minutes and then um after that we will have cases so there will be about a solid 15 cases that we can go through so if everybody just kind of takes a moment to put your names in um and we'll kind of go from there <laughs> Oh, amazing, cool. Can I just confirm um, that you guys can see my screen okay, yeah? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna move to the next page. The details of the Kahoot will be at the bottom right anyway. So people can just join as they come along, yep. Okay. Let's get that passed. Let's let this do its thing. Okay, amazing. All right, cool. So um, this talk is about chest x-rays uh, and essentially, we're gonna, be doing this, that down. we're gonna be doing some, we're gonna cover the learning objectives for the talk, first of all, um, and then we're gonna do an introduction with some basic anatomy. Then we're gonna have a systematic approach to the chest x-rays and kind of go through how you'd be expected to approach them in an exam situation. Uh, and then we've got cases. There are about 15 cases that we're going to go through, all of them relatively common things that things that you guys should be able to pick up. Um, and certainly for those who are a bit more senior, uh, things that you'd be expected to, to know for your finals. And then there'll be a summary and um, time for some questions at the end. Okay, so by the end of this talk, what I'd hope is that everybody can kind of know the basic anatomy um, from the chest x-ray. Uh, you should know how to assess the adequacy of a chest x-ray and also have a, a systematic approach to chest x-rays and understanding why a systematic approach is important. And finally, to recognize the common chest x-ray pathologies. Okay, so why, why is this important? Okay, so first of all, um, chest x-rays are the commonest type of um, x-ray that we do. Uh, I basically took a look at all of the x-rays that we have done at Guys and St. Thomas's over the last month. And in March, we essentially did about six and a half thousand. And that, that's more than double the kind of next um, nearest x-ray. The reason that that is important for all of you guys is First of all, um, it's a really common port of call for investigation for people who are GPs. Uh, whenever you're in, you're in a and &E or an inpatient becomes unwell, it's, it tends to be involved in part of the workup for the patient. Uh, the other thing is, you know, for, more relevantly, I guess, you know, it is a very easy station in uh, medical schools, exams and finals for examiners to put on. So, you know, they don't need very much, you know, they don't need an actor, they don't need anything. It, it's a very simple station for them to run. Um, and it tends to take up part of finals generally. So it's useful to have a really good grasp of how to interpret your chest x-rays. Finally, when you become a little bit more senior, understanding the chest x-ray is really important because as the junior doctor, you know, we radiologists put out reports, but it, you know, you might not see the report for an hour or two hours. And if the patient is particularly unwell, you might be the first person to see it. So spotting the most obvious abnormality is really helpful. Okay, so um, just a quick bit on x-ray basics. So um, just to understand, x-rays essentially are beams um, that are absorbed as they pass through tissues and they will pass through the tissues in the body to differing degrees. And the differences with the absorption of the x-ray kind of helps us to construct the image that you see. So having a look at this table, um, basically what's important to just think about when you're interpreting your x-ray is that things that appear black tend to be air or gas related and things that are the most dense, so things that will pair white on the image tend to be bone or calcium based. Everything in between, the different shades of gray will have different 
uh, characteristics. So dark gray tends to be fat because fat is not particularly dense and x-rays can pass through it very easily. Whereas stuff like soft tissue, like muscle um, uh, and breast tissue, because it's firmer and it has more texture to it, it tends to absorb more of the x-ray, which means it comes close to the white end of the spectrum being a little bit darker in its appearance. So thinking about that will really help you figure out if you see something abnormal, what it could be. So we're gonna start with some basic anatomy. Uh, for those who are kind of joining as we go along, the um, game pin for the Kahoot is at the bottom and feel free to join in. Um, there could be some cases probably about 10 to 15 minutes in. So going through basic anatomy, um, radiology is all about anatomy. Um, and essentially for a chest X-ray, the things that you really need to be aware of are the airways, the lungs, the heart and the mediastinum, the mediastinum being everything in the middle of the chest, the bones and the soft tissues. So to start with the airways and the lungs, uh, I'm just gonna show you, I hope you guys can, can, this is projected quite well. The essential airways that you need to know are essentially just the trachea. So coming down from the neck downward, you can see that this area here that's outlined is uh, black or appears more black than surrounding image. And that's your trachea and it goes all the way down to the level of about, I think they teach you about T4, T5 and it bifurcates at your carina. And the arrow can just point to that slight area where you can see that there's just more darkness compared to the other structures around it. And those are your main bronchi. So you've got your right main bronchus, which is shorter compared to the left main bronchus, which extends a little bit more out to the film. Then we have a look at our lungs. Now, um, obviously, you know, the, the lungs are probably the easiest thing to identify on the um, chest radiograph. But the important things are the uh, core areas that most people actually don't tend to look at. And those are the three areas that we've got um, arrowed out here. So the one at the top we've got is the apex uh, and the apices. We have one on the left and on the right. Those are very important because um, really things like pneumothoraxes or pneumothoraces, sorry, um, and consolidation, they tend to hide in these areas. And because you have so much of your rib shadows over these areas, it's really important that whenever you get a film and you're kind of going over your final bits, what we call your review areas, which we'll come on to, that you have a close look at your apices because things tend to be um, lost up there. We'll see a few cases with that as we go along. The other two angles that are really important, one that you probably would have heard of is the costophrenic angle, which is where your diaphragm, which is your nice smooth diaphragm meets the wall of the chest. That's a really important uh, review area. And then the cardiophrenic angle. Now, when I was in medical school, I never really heard about this one, but it, you can see how useful this is. So you can see the nice clear outline of our heart. You can see the nice clear outline of the diaphragm below. And at the point where your um, heart meets the um, shadowing from your aorta and the spine, you should be able to see a really crisp, almost 90 degree angle there. So you can see that there's nothing blocking out this area. So there's no um, consolidation or anything like that. So having a close look in this region is also quite useful. It's, it's a really key review area. Just to check, um, can I just check if you guys can see my mouse or, or are you guys not seeing my mouse? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, cool. All right, moving along. So now on to the heart and the mediastinum. So the kind of core areas that you need to be aware of here are um, what is it that is giving you the heart shadow? So at the top, you have your aortic arch, which is on the left side of the chest. Coming down a little bit further on the left, we've got our left hilum. Now the left hilum is where all the pulmonary vessels come in. So you've got your uh, pulmonary veins and your pulmonary arteries. We can't really differentiate which one is which from the chest radiograph, but we can tell that those are the vessels coming in. And you can almost draw a line, if you look really closely, radiating out from that hilum, almost like a spider web, upwards and downwards, you can see those vessels. And again, this is a really nice clear picture of a hilum. It has a very clear um, concave shape, which is normal. You want it to have that really nice concave shape. You shouldn't have anything in the middle here. Between the aorta arch and the hilum is the uh, aortopulmonary window, which in this case you can see is a nice black uh, structure, which means that there's air, which is a good thing. On the right, you've got the right hilum, which is very much similar to the left, but the one big difference here is that the right hilum always should be lower than the left hilum. 
uh, that's just how kind of how our anatomy works and has to do with the division of your um, bronchi on each side. So that's another important thing. So the right hilum should always appear lower than the left. And if it doesn't, that tends to be a marker of a problem. Then on the right hand side of the heart, you've got your right heart border. This is actually the right atrium that we've got here. And then on the left, you've got the left heart border, which kind of comes smoothly down along this edge, coming down towards the left ventricle. Um, and those are the kind of the essential areas. And uh, the most important thing from this is to, this is a really good picture of a normal chest radiograph. And what I want you to make a, take appreciation of is how crisp the borders of the heart is. You can almost take a pencil and draw a line along that heart border. And this is exactly what you kind of want to replicate every time you look at a chest X-ray to see if there's an abnormality. You should be able to see crisp borders of your left heart and your right heart. You should be able to see crisp borders of your hilum and you should be able to see your aorta. So um, kind of using this as a reference point and comparing it to all the other radiographs that you see is a really good starting point. Now with the heart and the mediastinum, there's this thing called the cardiothoracic ratio. Um, this is how you calculate it. So essentially you take a measurement in your mind, because uh, obviously in your exams, you might not be able to do this, but roughly you can think, you know, the widest border of the heart is from here to here, and that's the shorter arrow. And you look at the widest part of the chest, which is usually down by the diaphragm. And you just think, you know, does this heart take up more than 50 to 55% of the chest cap, the chest volume? And essentially, I know that um, you guys are taught 50%, radiologists tend to use 55%, but it doesn't actually really matter. It's it kind of, if you see that it, it looks larger than half the chest wall, it's normally something to kind of bear in mind when you're thinking about what could be wrong with the patient. Okay, now on to the next thing. So the next thing is actually about the bones. Now, um, I wasn't particularly good in medical school at counting ribs, uh, but, but counting ribs is actually really important, especially when you are assessing the adequacy of your chest radiographs, and we'll, which we'll come on to. Um, but you might notice that the ribs actually, they appear, uh, they're, they're much more ribs, or should I say that it's more crowded towards the apex of the lungs. So I'm just going to help you count these ones. So on the right hand side, I've got an arrow pointed to the fourth rib. How do we know it's the fourth rib? Well, if I count that as four, above that, just underneath, you have, this is the third rib here. You have your second rib, which kind of goes out towards the side, and that's the second rib there. And then and then right here is our first rib, which kind of comes more towards in the middle. So you've got one, two, three, and four. And then on the other side, I've put another arrow, and that's your eighth rib. So if we kind of use a similar kind of counting strategy from the other one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So that's your eighth rib. This is your ninth. That's your tenth. And you might not see the 11th and 12th because the diaphragm tends to obstruct them. So um, that's the method for how you kind of go about counting your, your ribs. Uh, and we'll come on to that a bit as well. And just on the right, I've got a highlight here. I don't know if you can notice, but essentially about the top 80% of your chest um, x-ray here in the lungs has a kind of more hazy texture to it. And that's the same on both sides. The symmetry is very helpful because you know there's very few things or very few pathologies that tends to have um, a symmetrical distribution exactly um, like this. Uh, and, and what you're seeing, if you compare this up here to lower down by the costophrenic angles, you might notice that the costophrenic angles appear darker. And that's just because the breast soft tissue, uh, because there's more tissue for the x-rays to penetrate, the chest itself appears a little bit more hazy, but it's normal. And again, you can see the soft tissue um, markings along the edges to let you know this is simply just breast tough tissue and that's the reason that things appear a bit more hazy. Okay, now that's all the basic anatomy you probably need to know. What I'm going to go through now is a quick systematic approach on approaching x-rays and this is the classic thing that tends to come up in OSCEs and what examiners tend to be looking for. I've done a few, uh, I've done some OSCE examining myself um, for St George's and for King's and I can kind of take you through what it is they kind of expect you to do as a, at a bare minimum. So step one, before you say anything, the most useful thing to say is obviously you identify your patient details, um, you say it's a chest x-ray, all of that is assumed. But in terms of interpreting, 
you, what you need to know is, is it a PA chest X-ray or is it an AP chest X-ray? Now, um, the reason that that's important is, first of all, if it's an AP chest X-ray, AP chest radiographs tend to be done in patients who are unwell. And that's because in order to have a chest X-ray done, what happens is the person normally has to stand up, they, used to, they have to hug the um, X-ray um, kind of uh, the, the plate um, and stand up and get their scapula out of the way. If someone is unwell, they feel breathless, they're uh, immobile, they won't be able to do that. So they have an AP chest radiograph. And an AP chest radiograph in your exams is normally an indicator that a patient tends to be unwell. And, there me and that usually means that there's a pretty significant abnormality on the chest radiograph you're looking at. The other thing about AP chest radiographs is because of how the divergence of your X-rays operate when you do an AP versus a PA film, you can't comment on the heart size. So don't fall into the trap of seeing an AP chest X-ray and then saying that there's cardiomegaly. You can't comment sufficiently when you have a AP chest radiograph on the heart size. When I was in medical school, they always taught us if you don't see a label, you should assume that it is a PA chest film. I've actually subsequently been told by a medical student this week that um, uh, some people don't like to hear that, but but either way, it's useful to know, you know, can I see that whether it's PA or AP? I don't see it in this, for this example, I can't see that any marking. So I would make the assumption that it is PA and that I can therefore comment on things as I normally would. So that's step one. Step two, now there is a little, um, little kind of mnemonic RIP, which stands for rotation, inspiration and penetration, okay? Now, um, the reason that this is important before you even start commenting on any abnormalities is that changing the rotation, the inspiration or the penetration actually changes the entire chest radiograph and how you interpret it. So for rotation, what's important is that you look at the medial end of your clavicle. So I'm just gonna use my mouse to point out the edge of the clavicle on that right-hand side and the edge of the clavicle on that left-hand side. Now, what you want is that this bit here, this kind of kind of circular bony bit here is the spinous process of your thoracic vertebra. And you want to, in your mind, measure the distance between the end of the clavicle and that spinous process and the end of the clavicle and that spinous process. Looking at this and eyeballing it, I tell you that this is roughly equal. So that means to me that the person is dead 90 degrees on to your chest, uh, to your um, to your x-ray plate and the x-ray is going directly through. So there's, there's no rotation. The reason that's important is if the patient is rotated, what ends up happening is that the heart shadow moves and so does the hilum. So you, you end up not having this clear, crisp picture that you would normally be used to interpreting with. So it's important to just be aware of that. The next thing is the inspiration. This is where our counting of our ribs kinds of come in. Now, an, a good inspiration is if you can see nine, roughly nine posterior ribs. Now, posterior ribs are the same kind of ribs we counted on the last one. So in this example, I'm just gonna show you, you've got your first rib here, you've got your second rib there, third rib is just hiding right on that area here. And then we've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't need to count anymore because I know that this is now got a good inspiration. And what that means is they've spread their lungs out nicely. And if there's any abnormality, any, any changes, I should be able to see it quite easily. The reason this is important is if you don't have a good inspiration, what ends up happening is you could just imagine that all of the, the markings, all of these like vascular markings you're seeing here, they crowd up. And it ends up looking like the patient ends up has, has it, is having a pneumonia, but it's actually not real. It's artifactual. It's a product of the how the X-ray is taken. So once you count all of your ribs and you know that you've got nine posterior ribs, you're good to go in terms of interpreting. And the last thing is penetration. Penetration is a measure of how well the X-ray beam has gone through the patient and towards the. Um, imaging plate behind them. So um, penetration is measured by just looking to see if you can see the spine, which is going along here, through the heart. So here, I'll try to convince you, I can see the box-like shape of a thoracic vertebra behind this heart. I can see one there, and I can see one here as well. Now, what that means is that if there is a problem behind the heart, so because we have lung behind of our heart as well, if you have a problem back there, the x-ray will go through it sufficient enough to let me know that there is a problem behind the heart or not. 
Okay, so that's rotation, inspiration, penetration. So we've gone through AP or PA and then RIP. And, and the examiners will expect you to comment on that um, for every patient that every chest x-ray you look at, okay? Good. Now, now the approach. Now, ultimately, after you've done those first few core steps, the rest of it actually doesn't matter that much. The most important thing is that you have formulated some kind of system in your mind of how you're going to go through everything on the chest x-ray. Now, some people go from outside in, some people go from inside center outwards. It doesn't actually really matter. Um, but ultimately, you want to rehearse enough when you're practicing with your friends and, uh, and do, you're doing your mock exams to know for the examiner to recognize that you've got some kind of protocol in your mind of how you approach it. What's on the right is just my approach. So I always start by looking at the trachea and checking that the trachea is central. Uh, that's quite useful because it's a good hint if there's any problem, any volume loss or, or um, pneumo tension pneumothorax or something like that on one side. I then come down, I look at both bronchi, the airways like we've talked about briefly before. I then examine the hyla. So you look to make sure your hyla have the normal concave appearance. I can see our aortopulmonary window up there. I can see um, a similar kind of, uh, well, it's not the aortopulmonary window, but I can see that there's a kind of black marking outlining that hilum and that's all normal, normal lung. The next thing I do is I just have a look at the heart. Uh, I look at those crisp borders that I'm looking for along the left side of the heart. I'm looking along the right side of the heart and um, I'm checking the kind of vessels. So I check all of those pulmonary vessels going down and I can make sure I can follow that spider web, as I said, all the way down. Anything that's not continuous with this, you know, um, might be an abnormality. Okay. Okay. And the next thing is then we look at the lungs. So I go from top to bottom and make sure you compare each side. Remember I said symmetry is your friend in radiology. If something is asymmetrical, it is normally abnormal. So you look for symmetry. So if you see something on the right side, you just take a look at the left and you make sure that you don't see the same thing on that left side. And you just compare each segment of the lung and we do it in zones. So you have an upper zone, you have a mid zone and you have a lower zone. And you can be clever and know about which lobe it's in, but that's probably not necessarily a core thing to know in your exams. Uh, they would be very happy if you identify a problem in the right upper or middle zones. Then the last thing are things like bones and soft tissue. Um, so you just, you can check the clavicles, you can check the scapula, sometimes you can get the head of the humerus there as well. And then simple things like rib fractures. So you just, if you have the time, um, or you certainly would demonstrate to your examiner, this is something that I would like to look at. You check along each bone just to make sure that you don't see any obvious jaggedy shapes or abnormalities in terms of the contour. You wanna be able to draw a nice smooth arc along, um, along the edge of each of those ribs. The last thing is review areas. Now review areas, are, I've mentioned all of them before, but I'm just gonna reiterate them because they are the areas where you will miss stuff all the time. I, you know, consultant radiologists still miss stuff in these areas every single time, every single day. And it's because they're hard to interpret and it's hard to always remember every single step of your process. But the more you practice, the easier it becomes. So you can see the apices are highlighted. You need to check the apices on every film that you look at, because if you have a small pneumothorax in your exam, you would miss it if you don't check the apices, okay? The next thing is the retrocardiac region. So through this heart, I want to try and convince you, if you look at the right side of the heart here where my mouse is, and you just compare it to the left side of the heart, you can, you can suggest really that the density on the right and the left are pretty much equal. I can see the smooth outline of the, of the aorta going down. I can see the smooth outline of my vertebral uh, bodies. I can see the smooth outline of the left side of the heart. I can't see anything sitting back here that looks irregular. So that's an area that you always need to focus on. And then the last thing are your angles. And we talked about your costophrenic angles and double checking the costophrenic angles every single time because you might have a pleural effusion that's hiding in those areas, okay? So that's generally the approach that I take for the chest X-ray. So this is a case example. I just thought it would be useful if I kind of highlight how I go through this chest X-ray. So the mountain, this is very, very clear and it's very obvious. When you step into a station, you might feel overwhelmed and think, oh, this, I know exactly what this is. And you lose the, um, 
structure of your uh, assessment. It's really important to be structured because that's what the mark scheme is going to be like. That's what they're going to be marking you on. Getting the answer in the exam is very often not the most important thing. It's just about being safe. So if I present this, I'd say this is a chest radiograph. Um, I would confirm the patient details. Obviously, they're not on here for data uh, protection reasons. Um, I, I, I can't see a marking on the chest radiograph, so I'm going to assume that it's a PA chest radiograph. I can see that um, the, the clavicles meet right in the middle, and they appear to be equal distance from the thoracic spinous process, so it's not rotated. If I count the number of ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's got good inspiration. And penetration-wise, obviously there's an abnormality on the left, but I can just see those thoracic spines going through the mediastinum. So there's good penetration here. For me personally, what I now do at this point is if the abnormality is as obvious as it is here, <laughs> I will mention it. Um, and then I will make sure I go back to my system. So um, just, just for the point of systems, the trachea is central. Um, I am unable to now make sense of the left hilum and the left heart border because it is obstructed by this density on the left lung. Um, I can see that density, and then you just describe it. So I can see that density is what I would say describe as homogenous. That is, it's the same throughout. It's not patchy. It all looks the same color. It's taking up somewhere probably between 50 and 75% of the left lung volume. And I can also see that it's got a nice dip in terms of its contour. So we call this the meniscus sign. Um, in terms of being systematic, I've now described the large subnormality, and then I go on to the right side. And I would then say the right hilum appears normal. So going back to my system, I can see the right hilum. I can see the, um, the nice concave shape of that hilum. Uh, looking at the lungs, I don't see any abnormalities on that right lung. I can see the diaphragm very smoothly. I can just see the right heart border there. That looks okay. I check the um, costophrenic angle on this side. Um, and finally, I would then do um, check the apices on both sides. The apices look normal. We've already assessed the costophrenic angles on both sides. And I do a quick check of the bones. But the obvious abnormality here is there is blunting of the left costophrenic angle. As I said, it's homogenous. You've got loss of your heart shadow. You've got a meniscus sign. And I've mentioned that the trachea is central. Now, keeping the structure is really essential with this. The reason the trachea central is being is important is because if you have something in one side of your lung that is really pushing and taking up so much volume um, that it distorts the anatomy, it will push the trachea to one side or the other. And this trachea is still pretty central. Um, I would say it's not perfect, but you know, for the purposes of uh, uh, the abnormality that we've got here, it's pretty central. So this is a good example of a left-sided large pleural effusion. And that would be the approach that I would kind of take to presenting this x-ray. So as I said, RI, um, AP or PA doing RIP, um, so rotation, inspiration, penetration. If there's a really glaring abnormality, you can start by describing it. Otherwise, if you don't know what it is, just go by your system. Airways, checking your hilum, checking the heart and the mediastinum, checking the lungs, checking those costophrenic angles, um, and then doing your review areas. So your apices behind the heart, and then quickly checking the bones. Okay. Now, the part that kind of everybody wants to, <laughs> to get onto are the cases. Um, so make sure you got your phone ready. Before we start, I'm just going to just say, you know, just double check if there are any questions. I don't have access to the chat. So I don't know if there are any questions in the chat or if anybody wants to raise anything before we get started. Sorry, could you just go over the AP and the PA, like how they differ again, please? Oh, yeah, of course. Sure, sure, sure. Um, now, I'm not sure this is going to let me go backwards, if I'm honest with you. Let me just give me two seconds. OK, so um, I'm a little it's not going to let me go backwards just because in presentation mode and I'm sharing my screen. But if I explain, essentially, because of how um, X-rays diverge, it's like a light, essentially. So with an AP chest X-ray, what ends up happening is it magnifies everything that's at the front of your chest. So things like your heart, which sits pretty anteriorly, is magnified compared to the other structures in your chest. 
So my advice is if you see a chest radiograph in your exam and there's no marking on it, it, the sensible thing to do is to assume that it is a PA chest radiograph. AP chest radiographs are always marked because they are not conventional, they are unusual, um, and they tend to be done in patients who are, are, are unwell. With an AP chest radiograph, the important thing to remember is that you cannot comment on the size of the heart because the heart will be artificially magnified. Um, so you wanna make sure that if you see an AP radiograph, you mention, you know, hey, I've, I've seen the heart and unfortunately I cannot comment on its size because this is an AP radiograph. And that will take you some good points with the examiner because they'll know that you understand the basics of how a chest X-ray works. Whereas a PA chest radiograph is normal and you can comment on all of the structures, whether it be the, the size of the heart, the size of the hilum, everything. It, it, it just is a more uniform film. I hope that answers your question. Was that all right? Hello? Yes, Stefan, we'll take the rest of the questions at the end of the session. Perfect, thanks, cool. All right, so if everybody's ready with the Kahoot, um, what we'll do now is um, we'll get ready to kind of go through all of the cases. So let's go next. So this is the first one. I'm gonna enlarge the screen slightly. Oh, let's do that and zoom in. So this is case one. Um, it's a 54, uh, these are all real x-rays, by the way, that I, I've seen in the last kind of two to three months. So um, this is a 54-year-old male who's presented with um, shortness of breath to a &E. And I want you to take a really good close look, go through your system, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, which will allow you guys to think, look at some options and think, what is the abnormality? music. Let's turn the music off. Wow, amazing. Okay, cool. So thanks. Thanks a lot for all you guys participating. So most of you went with COPD. Um, and then the rest were split between left pneumothorax or left lower pneumonia. Okay, cool. So I'll just explain. So this is COPD. So for those of you who got that right, well done. The reason it's COPD is the findings of COPD on a chest radiograph, remember to take your, your systematic approach. I'll tell you quickly, the trachea is nice central. I can see the heart borders relatively crisply along either side. The hilum looks normal. What is striking about the chest radiograph is the diaphragms. Now, look at the diaphragms here. They're very flat, very flat compared to the normal one that, we sh that I showed you guys. So if I just show you a comparison, the diaphragms on the left and on the right normally are not on the same level. And the reason that is, is because your right diaphragm sits a little bit higher up because your liver is sitting in your um, abdominal cavity and it pushes the right diaphragm up slightly. In people with COPD, their lungs expand so much that it pushes the diaphragm down. It actually causes the liver to be pushed downward further into the um, abdominal uh, cavity. Um, so that's how you know. Some, some people tend to count ribs to see if the patient is hyper expanded or not. But generally, um, I, I don't know if I, I don't know of any specific number of ribs that is best because the appearance of COPD can be so variable. My advice would be people who are hyper expanded have flattened diaphragms and you can just compare the contour of the right hemi diaphragm on the picture on the right hand side of your screen compared with the picture on the left hand side of the screen. You've lost that nice, smooth arc of the diaphragm on that side. And there's no focal consolidation anywhere that I can see here. What you're seeing behind the heart here are vessels. If you can draw a line through it and you can continue your line and it looks smooth, it's not gonna be an infection. Um, infection is patchy, remember that. Um, and for those who said pneumothorax, um, well, at the top, I will try to convince you that you can see some faint white lines crisply going all the way out to the edges. And we've got some examples of um, some of the other pathologies. So hopefully you can um, take away from that as well. Okay, well done. So now moving on to the next one. So case number two. So case number two is again, real life case, 54 year old patient who attended a &E with shortness of breath as well. And this was kind of probably over the period of about three months. So have a quick close look at that chest x-ray. 
Um, and then we're going to do the quiz for you guys to have a look at. Okay, amazing. So uh, most of you, good, went with lung collapse and a few with pleural effusion and a left pneumonia. So I'm gonna help those of you who um, didn't say lung collapse, figure out why it is a lung collapse. So it is left lung collapse. The first thing that you notice on this film, if you go systematically is apart from the obvious fact that there is a big whiteout on the left-hand side, what you see is that your trachea is no longer central. This film is not rotated. Um, which you would have picked up on your normal assessment. And you can see that trachea just looks as if it's going all the way over to the left-hand side. There are very few things that cause your trachea to completely deviate like that. The commonest is if you lose volume from one side of your lung. So if you think about it like this, if I've lost all the air from the left side of the lung and I've got tons of air on the right side of my lung, what ends up happening is that the trachea shifts in the direction of where there's less air, just from pressure differences. So that trachea shifted. The other thing that you notice is that you have a whiteout. More or less, this whole thing is pretty uniform in its color. You can't see any patchiness. You can't see um, uh, you can't see the hem you can't see the hemi diaphragm. It's not a line. You can't see the heart, and all of that is because everything has just been pulled over to that left hand side to fill the space that's now no longer being taken up by the lung. So. Um, Essentially, uh, for the people who are thinking about a pleural effusion, pleural effusion is a good thought, but the important thing to be aware of is a pleural effusion does not cause deviation of your trachea. It doesn't happen. On, the only things that cause deviation of the trachea for you to be aware of are collapse or a tension pneumothorax. Those are the two main things. Even in, even in pretty large sizes of pneumothoraces, you don't tend to actually have much tracheal deviation, although it can happen. But if you see a big tracheal deviation, think collapse or think tension pneumothorax. Those are the two top differentials to think about. And then this patient, you know, if, if the examiner then asks you, what do you think is causing this left lung collapse? Almost invariably, the cause of a left lung collapse is a tumor and that's because if you have a tumor that is blocking your left main bronchus which is the case in this scenario no air gets in uh, but you expire all the air out and the lung just collapses on itself so you get you can't get any air in and that's the most common cause of a left of a lung collapse in general in adults so that's a good thing to just be aware of as well okay nice hope that one's clear so we're going to move on to the next one so case number three, so 37 year old male presenting with shortness of breath over the last kind of eight hours. Have a quick good look and we'll move on to- Sorry to interject, Stefan. We just yeah. have a few people who would like some more time to review the image. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. So um, I will, what I'll do is I'll give you a good kind of 15, 20 seconds just with this picture. And then you have the extra 20 seconds when we do, when the quiz counts down. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. So now we're going to go on. You get an extra 20 seconds to have a look at the x ray and, and look at the options and see if you can match it up. Okay, nice. So what have we got? So we got the vast majority of you saying a left pneumothorax, uh, excellent, and a couple with COPD and a left pneumonia. Okay, so let's just go through. So with our systematic approach, when you get to your lungs, the, what you'll notice is, again, look for those lung markings. You can see nice, clear lung markings making it all the way to the edges on the right-hand side. 
And here on the left, you really can, it looks much darker than you would expect. And the reason for that is that this is now empty space. There is no, it's all air. Well, uh, well, it's empty space essentially. So almost like a vacuum. So you have nothing being able to absorb those x-rays going through. And you can actually now see the crisp border of that left lung, which is collapsed along the side here. And um, again, you, you almost notice that the, uh, if you were to look at the hilum, you notice that the left hilum doesn't look normal. It doesn't, it's, first of all, it's not above the right. That's, that's one of the things that we've always said that we should look for. And you can just see everything here is just collapsed. All those vessels that we were seeing so well um, demonstrated in the previous films is just collapsed along here. Um, now, left pneumothorax is the reason. Um, there's no evidence of tension. That's an important thing to say. It's important negative that you say, and you know that because you would have looked at your trachea. Your trachea in this picture is central. If the trachea is central with a pneumothorax, it's by definition not tension. A tension pneumothorax needs to have um, pressure from within that lung cavity, pushing your midline to the opposite side. So here the trachea is central. So you know it's just a normal pneumothorax, not a tension pneumothorax. Now, in case they ask you a couple of questions about it, you know, the commonest cause of pneumothorax, this patient is 34. It tends to be spontaneous. It tends to be very common in young men who are tall and who are smokers. Those are the commonest features. The other things that can sometimes be associated with pneumothorax are trauma, so road traffic accidents, um, and things like connective tissue disorders like uh, Marfan's disease can sometimes be associated with pneumothoraces. And finally, people with COPD very commonly end up having pneumothoraces as well. And the reason for that is that so much of their lung tissue is empty space, they get boule in their lung. And that's because you know the lung tissue is completely destroyed. So it doesn't take much for one of those boule to rupture and cause the entire lung to, um, to, to, to collapse down in a pneumothorax. Okay, so I hope that's clear. We've got the arrows pointing out everything um, just in case it's, it's not as obvious, okay? So we're gonna move on to the next one, which is case number four. So case number four, 42 year old male who's now presenting to um, his GP. He's been short, short of breath for the last nine days. And you have the task of looking at this chest x-ray. So just at the last time, I'll give you another 15 seconds and then you'll have an extra 20 seconds with the, um, with the countdown. All right, so we're gonna move on. Okay, so we've got a range of answers here. Good, good, good. So we've got most people saying it's a right pleural effusion. Um, we've got some people thinking it's a right lower pneumonia, right lower lobe collapse, a right high enlargement. So we'll go through each one of those. So um, it's a right pleural effusion. Now, why is it a right pleural effusion? Well, um, we mentioned about review areas. Now, the review areas on this side is if I show you on the left, I can pretty much trace a line. This person doesn't have great lungs to begin with, unfortunately, but, but I can draw a line along that left edge of that lung and I can almost get a nice little dip there on the left-hand side. On the right, I can't see that. I can't see the edge of my diaphragm um, and I can see this slight marking along here, which is almost like a mini meniscus. Now, for those who are thinking it might have been along the lines of a, of a pneumonia, the reason it's not a pneumonia is because um, the density, the density of what you're seeing in the right lower lung is uniform. It is completely homogenous. It is not patchy. Pneumonias are patchy. This is all the same color 
and it's all because it's fluid. The fluid is absorbing all of that X-ray and it's appearing the same appearance throughout it. So um, the features here, you've got blunting, it's homogenous, and you've almost got a mini kind of meniscus. If you see an abnormality on your chest X-ray, really zoom in, you know, don't be afraid in your exam to close up, take a close look and see if you can outline what the abnormality is. And you can see that line just along here. So this is a right pleural effusion. Um, with pleural effusions in your exams, the, the follow-up questions will tend to be causes. Um, so just have a think about whether it's a transudate or an exudate and kind of going through the surgical sieve for what those causes are. It's a little bit beyond um, what we're gonna be able to do today, but if it's something that you need to look up, it's a useful piece of information to just have in your mind so you can rattle off. Um, if you have bilateral pleural effusions, things like heart failure and renal failure should be top of your list. Um, whereas the causes for unilateral pleural effusion, as in this case, um, tend to be related to exudates. So that would be something to definitely make sure you look up. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the next one, which is, okay, cool. So a 32-year-old male who has presented with a fever um, to hospital uh, and has ended up having a chest x-ray. So I'll give you a little bit of time to look at that one. Okay, so just moving on to the poll now, all right? All right. So um, the vast majority of you went with pneumoperitoneum. Uh, so well done on that one. And we'll go through why it's pneumoperitoneum and not the others um, now. So pneumoperitoneum, this is a classic um, X-ray case for OSCEs. Um, now, the reason the patient's presented with a fever is because they've got something going on in their abdomen whether that be a perforation of an appendicitis or a pancreatitis or something is going on. Now, if you go through your systematic approach, when you come to your diaphragms, you notice, remember I said symmetry is really important. Looking at this left diaphragm, I can trace a line underneath all along to the edge. Whereas here, I have this appearance of my diaphragm, which is here, but I have this line above it. This line does not appear normal. Um, it's it's no, certainly not on the other side. Uh, and that's how you know that there's, a, there's an abnormality. Between the line and between the diaphragm, the density is dark. As I started at the beginning of the um, tutorial, dark tends to certify air. And this is not within the lung. It is because you've been you've had a perforation within the abdomen. That's air is now pushing, tracking up above the liver and pushing the diaphragm up. So you have subdiaphragmatic free air. If you say that in your exams, it's it will be full points because it's a classic kind of buzz phrase. So the appearance of this appearance is perforated abdominal viscous. So as I said, things like appendicitis, things like diverticulitis, these kinds of things, or if the patient is post-surgical. Um, those are the kind of things to think about in your differentials if they ask you for one. It isn't a pneumonia because um, this is too well-defined, this, this line that you see here. It's too clear, it's too well-defined. And it's there's, the lungs themselves appear, um, they, they appear uniform on both sides. You, you can see the density. You just look at this lung on this side, you compare it to probably an area over here. It looks pretty similar. I can't see any patchy areas anywhere. And these little things you're seeing here, these are vessels. If you can draw a line, as I always say, through it, like a spider web, 
that's vessel, and you don't want to misinterpret that for a consolidation. Okay. Next one, case number six. So another third two-year-old male, um, real life case, shortness of breath and cough over the last four days. So I'll give you guys some time to have a look at that one. All right, we're going to move on to the poll and you can see if you can figure out what's going on here. Okay, okay, good, okay. <laughs> so this, we've got a split. Um, the vast majority of you either think it's a right upper lobe pneumonia or a right middle lobe pneumonia. Um, and some of you also query whether it could be a collapse. Great. Now this will helpfully explain a little bit about densities. So this is a right upper lobe pneumonia. Why? So first of all, the density, I just want you to have a really close look at this. You can, you can confuse yourself and say, oh, it looks pretty uniform. But if you have a really close look, you can see that there are areas of darkness within the area of increased density. It is patchy. It's certainly not like the plural effusion that we saw. It just looks like, it almost looks like a spider web kind of fanning out, out into a different area with these areas of darkness in between and these areas of white kind of increased density around it. So why is it upper lobe? Well, the reason it's upper lobe is just going back to our anatomy, your horizontal fissure um, is not normally seen on your chest X-ray, but you can see that this, whatever this abnormality is, is really well delineated by this sharp border here. Now, um, pneumonias don't tend to have sharp borders unless it is confined by an anatomical region. So this is your horizontal fissure here. You can't see your oblique fissure because it's, it's posterior, you don't tend to see them, but your horizontal fissure is usually a good clue. So whatever structure, whatever problem is going on in the right upper lobe, it is completely ending at that horizontal fissure. So you know it's only confined to one area, it's, it's within that lobe. These small areas of black density that you can see it's a little bit hard, I must be honest, but um, if you really zoom in and have a close look, they're just these small little circles, these small little black circles within this um, overall abnormality. And those are air bronchograms. Now, air bronchograms mean that you have airways that go into your lung. Now, when you have a pneumonia, the pneumonia or the infective process is within the alveoli. It's not within your airways. Your airways still remain open. So there's air inside of those airways to pet, to allow the X-ray um, to go straight through it. That's why you end up with these air bronchrams. So if you're trying to differentiate if it's a collapse or a pneumonia, first thing to think about is, do you see those air bronchrams? And I'll try to convince you, you can see them on this case. The other thing to be aware of is that in a, in a collapse, be a, if we just think about it logically, a collapse means that the lung is no longer functioning. It, 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 you lose volume. So if, in order for this on the right upper zone to be a collapse, what happens is your horizontal fissure, and I would like to let you know, this is the normal position of a horizontal fissure. If it was collapsed, you'd lose volume. So automatically what would happen is that horizontal fissure, you'd see it really sharply in a collapse as well, but it will be up here. And that's because all the lung and all the air that's in that region is just squashed itself into the top aspect of your apex. So for those of you who thought it was a collapse, it's not a bad thought. It's certainly um, good to have differentials. So the two top differentials would be right upper lobe pneumonia and shortly after right upper lobe collapse. It's great differentials to have, okay? Um, and obviously, 
if you if they give you a bit of history about the presentation, use what they give you to figure out what's wrong. If this person is presenting with fever or cough, feeling generally unwell, it tends to go with an unwell infective process rather than a collapse. Collapse just presents with shortness of breath. Um, whereas fever, cough, hemoptysis, those kinds of things, those tend to indi indicate that there is an inflammatory process going on in the lungs. Okay, cool. So we're about halfway with the cases. <laughs> so um, here's another one for you to look at. These are all core cases. So um, have another kind of 30 seconds or so to look at this one, and then we'll move on to the poll. Okay, moving on to the poll then, yeah. So 63-year-old male, shortness of breath. Okay, so most of you are thinking along the lines of pulmonary edema, um, and a few were thinking along the lines of left hilar enlargement. I'm going to go through all of these differentials to make sure that we exclude, so you have a close understanding of what's going on here. So this is pulmonary edema. Why? First thing, going back to the basics, and at the beginning of this, we said, can you see if it's PA or PA or AP? Now, there's no marking on this, so I have to assume, looking at this, that it's a PA chest radiograph. Now, knowing that it's PA, I know I can assess the size of the heart, and I just want you to eyeball from edge to edge of this heart using these arrows, and then if I do a similar arrow all the way across the chest wall, this heart takes up way more than 50% of the chest. That's clue number one, so you've got cardiomegaly. The second thing I want you to appreciate is for those of you who said left hilar enlargement, you're not wrong um, because this hilum is not well-defined and neither is the one on the right. And the reason you have the engorgement of the hilar vessels is because your heart's not functioning properly. So because your heart is not pumping all of that blood into your aorta as normal, it's backflowing and it's going back up into your uh, pulmonary vessels. So they appear larger than they normally would. And in the books, you might see something called perihilar opacification or perihilar uh, uh, edema. Either, either way, the area along the hyla look just hazy. It doesn't look right. The other thing I want you to try and appreciate is the vessels. So these vessels, you can see some vessels going down on the right side, but I want you to just, if you take a, if you just sit back and look back, you would appreciate most of those vessels are going upward the vast majority of your markings are going up towards the apices of your lung. And I want you to really, um, when you go away, compare this to what a normal chest x-ray looks like. The vessels are not normally this prominent when you look at the apices. And the reason that's happening is because you're having upper lobe diversion. The vessels are trying to get to, to lung that is well aerated because the lung at the bottom is not as well aerated as the lung at, your, at the top of your lung, just generally from physiological um, purposes. So it's trying to get as much air as possible. So your blood vessels actually divert to the top. So putting all of that together, I've got cardiomegaly, I've got upper lobe diversion. And when I come to do my review areas, what I notice is I can see that right cost front angle, nice and crisp. On the left, I'm tracing, I'm tracing, I'm tracing. Oh, what, what, why is the left diaphragm higher than the right? We've talked about this at the beginning. The right diaphragm is usually higher than the left because of the presence of the liver. This is an effusion. There's a small pleural effusion sitting here. And the features of heart failure on a chest radiograph, I think there's a mnemonic for it, I believe there's A, B, C, D, E. But essentially, cardiomegaly, you can get curly B lines, which I would argue that you have. You have a few over here, just on the corner of that film, just along there. Um, you have effusions, so you have a 
a left pure effusion in this case, you don't have one on the right, and you get that perihilar opacification. So the cause here, left ventricular failure causing pulmonary edema. So well done to, to those of you who got that one. Uh, it's a little bit more of a difficult film, but really take your time, look at all of the abnormalities and see if you can just put them together into one diagnosis because it normally is about just picking up some clues. Okay, moving on to the next one. So we're over halfway now guys, so uh, re well done. So this is now case number eight. It's a 42 year old male who's presenting to the a &E department. There's shortness of breath over the last kind of nine days. And when I give you these histories, I want you to really think about them and just think about if, if you didn't have the chest X-ray, what differentials would you be thinking of? And then apply those differentials to the chest X-ray you're seeing in front of you and see if you can find evidence for each of them. So I'll give you 30 seconds for that one. And then we're gonna give you an extra 20 seconds with the poll. Okay, so we're gonna just move on to the poll. So this one is, this one is is hard. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, it's it's much more subtle and it's much more difficult. The vast majority of you have gone with a bilateral hyalinopathy. Okay. So the the answer is actually left pneumonia. Why? Okay. So going along, first of all, look at the corner of your film. This is an erect PHS radiograph. So normal normal taking. The chi is nice and central. Now, looking at our hyla, I will agree with you that the hyla is does not appear normal. But if I look at the right hyla, I can see the right shape. It's certainly the right shape. And the, the other really good tip with the hyla is if you can see air in between the heart border and the hyla, then it's normally normal. Um, because remember, your vessels just kind of go out towards the periphery of the lung just a little bit. Now on the left-hand side, what is abnormal here is, I would agree, there's some increased density around this region here. But what are the features of that density? First of all, it's patchy. This is the first thing I would say. It doesn't look uniform. And if, again, you zoom in and you have a close look, amongst the areas of increased density, you have these small circles, these small black circles. Those are your air bronchograms trying to give you a clue that this is a pneumonia. Now, the left heart border, what, what the problem that you have here is very closely associated with the left heart border. You can probably still make out the, the edge of your left heart border, maybe just, but it's not as clear as I normally would like it to be. And that tells you that this is a left lingular pneumonia. The lingula is a left aspect of the um, upper lobe of the lung that is closely folding over the heart. It's almost the equivalent of your right middle lobe. So this patchy density on the left-hand side goes with a pneumonia. I would agree that, as I said, the hilum does not look right, but that's not because the hilum is abnormal. It's because you're having this patchy changes along this aspect here that is going um, with the actual lung parenchyma. And again, the air bronchograms are, are usually there to help you. That's a really difficult one. So if you can start, if you can pick that one up, you're doing really, really, really well. Um, and it might be definitely one to just kind of make sure you have a look at again to try and see if you convince yourself. I hope that one was clear. Um, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, Okay, so this is a 39 year old male who's presented to his GP because he's feeling very, very, very fatigued. He's not feeling well. Um, and you get asked to have a look at the chest X-ray.
Okay, so we're going to go on to the poll now. Nice. Okay, excellent. So um, most of you went with bilateral hilar enlargement, and I hope you can um, use this case to contrast to the last one. So this is bilateral hilar enlargement. Why is it bilateral hilar enlargement? So first of all, um, the hilar are meant to appear concave, and I will try to convince you that I cannot see the nice bend in that hyla from your vessels going up and down in your normal appearance. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it just looks really, really bulky. It just, it, it looks more rounded than um, compared to the other pictures that we've seen. Uh, and radiology is all about kind of just knowing what normal looks like, the variations of normal, and, and being able to differentiate that. The other clue that's on this x-ray is that the left hilum, if you look at it, it goes from here at the bottom all the way to just above that left main bronchus. It's very large and it is higher than the, sorry, the right main bronchus, so the right hilum, sorry, forgive me. The right hilum is higher than the left. And I've pointed out at the beginning, the right hilum should never appear um, at the same height or higher than the left hilum. That is normally evidence of enlargement. And again, that right hilum, again, just looks way too bulky. There's too much density in that area. Now, bilateral hilar enlargement is a question that you will be asked forever. Even when you're a medical registrar, people will ask you, what are the causes of bilateral hilar enlargement? Because it is so common. Um, bilateral hilar enlargement, you need to commit this to memory. It will always be the same. And you will always be asked this question <laughs> as an F1 uh, and onwards. The causes are sarcoidosis lymphoma and TB in that order. So the commonest cause of bilateral hyaluronic enlargement, especially in young people, is sarcoidosis. After that, it will be lymphoma. And after that, it will be TB, assuming that there's nothing else on the chest X-ray. If that's all you see, those are your top three differentials. So make sure you commit that to memory. Um, I hope that one um, helps to contrasting this one to the previous one we saw with the um, pneumonia, the left lobe pneumonia, the left lingual pneumonia. I hope that is more clear that you can just see the, 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 the large, the, the biggest part of the abnormality here is focused on the hilum. And in contrast to the other one, that left heart border actually looks pretty nice and smooth. You can't see any patchiness going along there. And the right heart border as well Nice and clear all along those edges there. Okay. We're in the home stretch. So this is just a quick question. So if someone shows you this chest x-ray and they ask you, well, what do you think this structure is? I'm using the black arrow to point to it. I want you to just have a think. What do you think it is? Um, before we look at the options, there are quite a few extra things on this chest x-ray. Um, but what do you think this circular one is? And where is it located? Um, I, just to mention, I know that some people are raising their hand to ask a couple of questions. Because of time, what we're going to do is we'll ask, we'll address all questions at the end of the um, presentation, because I don't want to take up too much of your Friday night. Um, so just make sure you know if there's a particular problem with a particular um, x-ray we can always go back and have a look at it at the end so just mark it down and, and we can hopefully have time to go through it okay here we go so we're going to move on to the poll Okay, cool. So 
slightly split between mitral valve and aortic valve. Um, uh, so I'll explain to you what the difference is. So this is a mitral valve, uh, the reason. So just if we go back to our anatomy, um, what we know is this on the side here that my mouse is highlighting is the left side of the heart. Now, think about where our aorta is coming from. So our aorta is up here. And that aorta we know from our anatomy comes from here and curls over to that side. So any aortic valve is actually located much higher in the chest. The mitral valve is here. And, and the reason for that, again, is this line along the left border of the heart that corresponds with your left ventricle. So it makes sense that blood flows through that valve and then up through this area and into our aorta over here. So this is your uh, mitral valve. Mitral valves are also, um, they're pretty common. Um, but if you see a valve, you know, on the chest X-ray, this increased ring-like density here, the chances are mitral or aor aortic, they are both very good picks to know. Um, it's very unlikely to be a tricuspid or a pulmonary valve. And that's because valve, valvular um, abnormalities on the right side of the heart are much less common than on the left. Um, so certainly, and because this is a left of the um, spine, uh, this is in the left side of the heart. The right side of the heart is on this side of the chest. Um, and you don't tend to, as I said, have valvular issues with the, with the right side of the heart as often. The other thing that you, there are a couple of the bits on here that are, that are just really nice to know. This is a pacing device. You can see it implanted under the chest and it has wires that go all the way around. One is inserted into the right side of the chest uh, over here and one is in the left ventricle over here. And then you have these kind of ring-like structures along going up top of the chest. These are midline stenotomy wires. So whenever you see, you know, I'm sure you've examined cardiac patients before and you've seen midline stenotomy wires on them um, or midline scar, this is what it looks like on a chest radiograph. So that metal is really nicely highlighted, outlining the middle of the chest there. And these tend to be cardiac patients. So if you have this in your exam, um, it might be that they just want you to uh, outline what the abnormality um, or what the um, instruments are. But these tend to be cardiac patients, people with mitral valves, people with midline stenotomies, people with pacemakers, their heart usually functions quite poorly. So if you see that, start looking for things um, for evidence of heart failure. Uh, I can reassure you that on this one, there, there isn't any evidence of heart failure. So this one's doing pretty well, but it's a good clue. Always think what's next in terms of from what you see, there is, it normally is giving you a clue what else you need to look for. Nice one. Okay, so this one is a four-year-old. And while the focus of I, the vast majority of your chest X-rays are gonna be in adults, this one is just to highlight a particular point. So it's a four-year-old, with a cough, it, these, um, as we've gone on, as you can see from case number one up to case number 11, the cases have gone a little bit harder. I just want you to take your structured approach, take your time and see if you can just hone your eyes in for very subtle areas of abnormality. So you're gonna get another 30, 30 to 40 seconds to have a look at that and then we'll do the poll. Okay, we're going to move on to the poll. Okay, so um, we've got um, the two commonest answers, right middle lobe pneumonia and pneumoperitoneum. Okay, well done. So um, this is right middle lobe pneumonia. 
And for those who said pneumoperitoneum, I'm going to address that first because this is actually, this is a little bit tough. Um, so underneath your left diaphragm, you can see a lucent area here. I agree. The, the first question to always make sure you ask yourself is, could this be represented by any normal anatomical structure? And the reason that it is normal in this case is because on the left-hand side, remember your stomach sits right there. And very often you, you can get the density, the air density of your stomach sitting right underneath the left hemi diaphragm. So it can be really tricky. The reason that this is, uh, you also don't see it on the right-hand side. I know the example I showed you earlier was unilateral, but pneumoperitoneum, you tend to see it on both sides. And this density, this line density here is very wide. It's very thick. Um, and that, that is the normal appearance of your diaphragm with just some um, lung sitting, not lung, sorry, stomach sitting beneath it. Now, for those who didn't pick up, it was a right middle lung pneumonia. As I always say, you know, look at the heart borders. Your heart border needs to be crisp and sharp. If you can't draw a pencil along it, something is wrong. So look, if you just follow my arrow, you can see nice, clear heart border. And then here, 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 and here. I can't see it, it's not clear, it's patchy. Now, whatever is obstructing it, as you know, could be the right hilum or it could be right lung. And what we know is if you just follow, again, those small little circles, those small little black circles, those are your air bronchograms again, giving you a clue that this is an infection and it is not a abnormality in terms of an enlargement. This is all pneumonia affecting the right middle lobe. We know it's right middle lobe because anytime you've lost the shape of your right heart border, automatically it is right middle lobe pathology. Um, that's a nice little just tip to know. So obscuration of the right heart border is right middle lobe, just how obscuration of the left heart border is left lingula. Those are just two really important points to be aware of. Um, now with middle lobe consolidation, um, the things are typical bacteria can cause this, but if they ask you in your exam, the other thing to really be aware of is aspiration. Aspiration pneumonia tends to affect your right middle lobe more often than other, other areas of the lung. And that's because the right bronchus is shorter than the left, so it's easier to go down. And your um, bronchus intermedius, which is the um, section of bronchus after you've got the division, tends to go straight into your right middle lobe before it gets to the lower lobe. So any, anything that you, you um, inhale down this way will just tend to, by probability, end up in that area more often. So a little bit tough, but um, well done for if you spot it out. Remember, air bronchograms are your friend. Symmetry is your friend. Look at your heart borders. And if it looks abnormal and you're ooming and eyeing, have a really close interrogation because your instincts are usually right. Okay, we've just got a few more cases left. Um, these are going to become just progressively harder. Uh, probably if there are any more senior uh, medical students here, these ones might be for you to pick up on. Um, but this one is a 24-year-old female with a chronic cough. Um, go through it systematically. Even if you don't know the exact answer of what it is, I'm sure you can help to pick up what you think is going on. Okay, we're gonna move on to the poll now, okay? Nice, okay. So for all of you who've said right upper lobe pneumonia slash tuberculosis, you're both right in this case. Um, why? So just similar to the case that we showed a bit earlier for those of you who were here from the beginning, what you see in the right upper zone is patchy, 
it has aerobrongograms, um, you know that it is consolidation. So infection is your top differential. The important thing to know about TB uh, is, and if you've never seen it before, it's just something you would you you wouldn't have been exposed to. So to call this right upper lung pneumonia, I mean, no one is going to argue with that. It is a it is a form of pneumonia. It is specifically TB because upper zone densities, uh, having a right upper lobe uh, pneumonia or left upper lobe pneumonia, I mean, these are relatively uh, uncommon because if we think about it, you know, how our bronchi operate and how gravity operates is that infections tend to go toward the lower segments of your lungs. There are few bacteria um, and specific bacteria which tend to affect the upper lobes more predominantly. So patchy consolidation in your right upper zone, the top differential in someone who's got a prolonged cough is tuberculosis until proven otherwise. Um, there are also some other bacteria that can cause it, things like Klebsiella and these kinds of things, but TB is usually very, very high up on your differential list. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're doing your exam and you say that you've got a right upper lobe consolidation, TB has to be on your differential list. The other thing that you can sometimes see in TB is hyalur enlargement. Um, there isn't any hyalur enlargement on this particular um, one, but you know it's a good thing to look out for because you get enlargement of the lymph nodes, which are around the hyalur region. Um, and, and that tends to also help further clinch the diagnosis. So remember to put your history together with what you're seeing. Prolonged history of cough in London, TB is your top differential. Okay, we just got a couple more left. Uh, well done if you stuck around for so long on your Friday evening. This is your case number 13, a 40 year old male with chest pain. Have a really close look, you know, um, do your systematic review because this one is a little bit more difficult. Okay, uh, so we're going to move on to our poll. Okay, okay, wow, okay, cool. So this is a good one. Um, so we've got quite a few, about a third of you thinking it's normal, a third of you thinking it's COPD, a third of you thinking it's uh, right pneumothorax. So great. So this is a good learning step for you guys. So this one, we mentioned about review areas. Now, for those who thought it was COPD, I can completely understand why you'd say that. The diaphragms look a little bit flatter than the, uh, the others that you've seen. The only thing I would say is you can see that there's a really nice curve towards the uh, lateral aspect of your diaphragm. Nice curve here, nice curve here. With COPD, if you go back and compare it to the last picture, that curve is not as prominent. It is just a lot more flat. It looks more, um, it just looks much more flat. The, the, this is a really nice convex curve that you've got pointing downwards towards those cost different angles. Now here I've used the arrow and I've used an invert image because even for radiologists, it can sometimes be hard and we have to do things to manipulate the image to figure it out sometimes. We invert the image. So everything that appears um, dark appears white, everything that appears white appears dark. And you can see that lung edge is just right there. You cannot, and if you compare it to the opposite side, follow from your high limb up, those vessels going up, they go all the way to the top ribs. And on the right, you look much more closely and you notice, the top area, that apex, it's too dark. It just doesn't look, if you compare the apex to the mid zone, it doesn't look the same. It's much too dark. And that's because you've got a right apical pneumothorax on that side. So uh, much more difficult, much more subtle. But again, taking your time, going systematic, 
it, it makes it a little bit easier. Obviously, I, I appreciate that, you know, um, in an exam, you might have 10 minutes to look at a chest x-ray and here you probably got around a minute, but hopefully the little tips that I'm pointing out will um, help you to focus your eyes and figure out what's normal and what's abnormal, okay? So two more cases. Um, okay, yeah. So this one is a 51-year-old male with a cough. Have a close look at this chest x-ray and I'll give you about 50 seconds. Okay, so we're going to move on to the poll now. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got most of you thinking of left pleural effusion, some thinking uh, pulmonary edema, and then fewer of you thinking it is a left lower lobe pneumonia or a right middle pneumonia. Now, the most important thing about this chest x-ray, guys, is um, ultimately getting the diagnosis, as, a, as I know, as, as good as it feels, um, is not the main important point of the um, exercise in your OSCEs. The most important thing is to go through the steps. Now, this is left lower pneumonia. The reason is um, if we kind of go through our review areas, we can see that if you compare it to the film that was taken after the patient received some treatment on the left, the area behind the left heart, it is too dense. If you, if you look at that left heart border you can see some you can see a nice kind of clear left heart border but the closer in you go into the midline you can see that there's a graduation in terms of the density and looking at our previous films which i've shown you the left heart the area behind the left heart should really be uniform it should not graduate like that so you have an area in the middle which is too dense and the area on the outside looks normal now um those who thought it was a pleural effusion, I think is a really good differential to have. And certainly if you said it in the exam, I mean, no examiner is gonna fail you for thinking that. But having a having the two main differentials here would be left lower lobe pneumonia and a left pleural effusion. In this case, the reason it's not a pleural effusion, and this is very, very hard on this one, but I will point out to you that if you actually look in the, in the hair, area here, which is where our costophrenic angle would normally sit, while it's not completely black, I'd, I'd like to try to convince you that the area that you see behind the heart is much more increased in density compared to the area where your costophrenic angle is. The area costophrenic angle is, is too, um, uh, it is much lighter in terms of its color. The area behind the heart is much denser. If you had a pleural effusion, it would, um, it would pool in the costophrenic angle first before going up here. So I would expect the density to be even more dense here and it would be more homogenous. This area here, and the areas behind the heart are very difficult because there's so much going on, but it is much more dense. It's a little bit patchy um, and certainly retrocardiac opacification. The top differentials you have to think about are uh, left lower lobe pneumonia or left lower lobe collapse. It's not a collapse in this case because there's no volume loss. The diaphragm is at the right level. And again, if you compare it to the after picture, you can just see that whole area behind the heart looks so uniform 
It looks so crisp, it looks so clear. You can see your aorta, you can see your cardiophrenic angle, those review areas we talked about before. Here, I can't really see it. I'd be really struggling. I can't see the left diaphragm, it's not well outlined. And that's just because you've got a lot of consolidation process going on behind that heart. Okay, so that's that's a really challenging one to kind of get you um, getting your eye in for the really focal areas that you just need to, to hone your eyes in, especially when you become an F1, F2. These are the core things, the core areas, because you can very easily walk past the chest x-ray and think this is, is normal while the person is sitting there with a, with a left lower lung pneumonia. Okay, last one is just for interest. It's not core. It's not, you know, something that you need to be able to identify, but it's just a, a, a nice one to show a little bit more about radiology. So this is a 39-year-old female who had noisy breathing. Uh, I want you to kind of go through your systematic steps. And if you can just locate where the abnormality is, uh, you're doing really, really well. And you'll have a stab at the pole, but, you know, by no means is this last one something that you will see in your exam finals or so I mean, I'd be surprised if, if it was there. Okay. Last one, guys, so we're moving on to the poll and we'll be finished in the next kind of five minutes. Okay, okay, wow, okay, good. So lots of you have gone with thymic tumor, the rest of you have gone with thyroid goiter. I mean, either or, if you've picked either of those, you've done super well. It is a goiter, um, but it could be a thymic tumor. Um, this particular case, um, what's happened here is sometimes you get retrosternal, so behind the sternum, extension of a goiter. Um, and what happens is it tends to push your uh, trachea to one side. Now, I can try to explain to you why it's not a thyroid mass. The reason for that really is, remember that your thyroid sits directly next to your trachea. And by enlargement, it pushes the trachea over to one side. Uh, the thymus is located anteriorly. So it's in front of the trachea in the upper aspect of the chest. When it enlarges, it's very unlikely to push to one side. It's much more likely to actually just push the trachea backwards. So you don't tend to get the deviation. Um, I'm just pointing this out to you because everything is not always about the lungs and the heart. Sometimes you can see other abnormalities. If you picked up this large abnormality here, well done. The most important, for, if you went systematically, the most important thing that you would have noticed is the trachea is being deviated by something sitting here. And that is really quite good enough. So well done to everybody. There are over there are about 200 of you here, still here on your Friday night. So thank you so much for, for coming around. I'll just quickly do a summary. So um, these are really common for exams. Um, I hope you remember the relevant chest anatomy and what the normal appearances are. Really remember the review areas because that will tend to save you if you don't know what's going on. There's a systematic approach and always try and keep your systematic approach. Um, and remember that it's all about patterns. Patterns and symmetry are the most important thing with your chest x-rays. So keep looking. Um, there's a website called Radiopedia um, and there's also radiologykey.com. They're really good websites. Um, and there is a book actually, which is really simple. Um, it's called Accident and Emergency Radiology. Uh, and it's got a chapter on chest x-rays there. That's about 20 pages. And it has every single thing you need to know for your level about chest x-rays, the commonest pathologies, all about the anatomy um, and everything for that. Um, we're going to do questions after. Uh, I know Ria is going to ask to share for, for her to share her screen, but that's that's those are my details. Reach out if you, you know, you want to know anything about radiology, you, want, you have any questions about the actual presentation that you would like to ask privately, um, or you have any questions about radiology as a specialty. And I'm going to stop sharing now.
Thank you guys for coming to the event. We'd really appreciate it if you guys could scan the QR code to fill in the feedback, after which the slides will be made available. And thank you so much, Stefan, for coming in to run the session. Um, there are a few questions from the chat box. So is it OK if I just go through a few of them? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a question here which is asking whether you could repeat the first slide about tissue absorption. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, would you like me to re reshare or what's the best thing? Um, yeah, you can reshare. Yeah. I'll put the link onto the chat for everyone. Oh, cool. All right. Um, let me just uh, get the actual presentation up and then I'll, I'll go to that. Yeah. So um, the essential point about tissue absorption that I was trying to make um, is that, remember, let me share my screen. Uh, I'm just going to do that one. Down, 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 down. Yeah, so the essential point I was trying to make is that x-rays are absorbed by our body, right, as they come through the... Um, x-ray uh, producer and essentially what happens is the things that absorb x-ray the most are things that are dense so things like bone things like calcium those things absorb the most x-ray and because it's absorbed it almost causes a shadow on the film that you um, that we end up seeing and the shadows are white essentially so those things tend to be the most dense so they come white on the image because they absorb all of the x-ray where stuff that are less dense, stuff like the lung, uh, stuff like the trachea, those things absorb much less of the x-ray and it ends up appearing more black on the image. Everything in between are shades of gray and you just have to think about density. So fat is not particularly dense. So it comes out as a darker gray. It's more close to the black end of the spectrum. Whereas stuff like soft tissue, like muscles, things like breast tissue, things like the heart, those are really good examples. They absorb a lot more of your x-ray. So they appear much more on the whiter end of the spectrum. So they appear more dark gray, or, well not dark gray, sorry, brighter gray uh, or closer to white. And the reason that's important is if you see something that is white, in your lung field, for example, you know that x-ray is not penetrating that area and you have to figure out why. So things like pleural effusion, things like consolidation, those, those are the things that will not allow your um, x-ray beam to go through well enough. And the other key, key tip is just compare it to the opposite side. If you compare it to the opposite side and it's not there, it's normally an abnormality. Cool. Yeah. There's another question here which asks, which ribs do you count, the anterior or the posterior? Yeah, so um, this is tricky. Uh, you count the post, when you want to assess, where, where is it? When you want to assess uh, whether the, you've got the right number of ribs, it's posterior. Some books will also mention anterior, I won't dispute that, but conventionally, and certainly your exams, posterior ribs are what you should be counting, okay? So from the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Once you've got nine, good inspiration, nothing more to be worried about with respect to inspiration. And um, why does a pneumothorax show as black, but a lung collapse is white? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So a pneumothorax, if we think about it, um, air is not meant to actually be between your pleura. You've, if you just go back to your anatomy, your pleura is made of your visceral pleura and your uh, parietal pleura, and they actually are really close proximate, proximity to each other. Now, a collapse ends up as appearing as white because although all the air is gone from inside of that lung, the lung tissues then just then kind of congeal together. So what you, the reason you're seeing whiteness is it's almost like soft tissue, just a bunch of soft tissue just pulling up, bunching up together, that's not allowing the x-ray to go through. Whereas in pneumothorax, there's actually ends up being increased air. We use the term air, it's not actually air, but essentially what has happened is the pressures don't allow your visceral pleura to be closely approximated to your parietal pleura that well. So you end up with an air-like density between the chest wall and the lung edge. So that's why it that ends up being dark because there's no, it's not fluid, it's not anything else. It's just what is essentially air 
between those two spaces. Whereas a collapse, all the tissues can collapse together. So it, it absorbs the chest X-ray almost like if it's the heart, for example. And uh, one more question here, it's asking, what's the difference between pulmonary edema versus pleural effusion on a CXR? Okay. Uh, so uh, pulmonary edema versus a pleural effusion. So this is a pleural effusion. Uh, this is a slide I showed a bit earlier. What, what is the difference? First of all, location. So pulmonary edema tends to occur around the perihilar area. That's where the densities tend to be much more uh, prominent. A pleural effusion, check your costophrenic angles. So your costophrenic angles, this area here is very dense. It, it is homogeneous. Pleural effusions are homogeneous. Pulmonary edema is not homogeneous, it's patchy. If you think about it just from a, uh, like a, what, what, what it actually is that you're seeing, this is almost like you're seeing water in the bottom, in the bottom of a mug. And uh, pulmonary edema is just kind of almost like you're spraying water throughout the lungs. So it's much more patchy, it's all over the place. Um, and it doesn't give you that nice homogeneous picture like all of this water, which is just sitting here, um, well, fluid, I should say, absorbing fluid. Whereas your pulmonary edema just looks a little bit different and you have other features to go with it. The, the fluid is within the alveoli, the heart is enlarged, and yes, you will also have pleural effusions, but the distribution is much more around the hilum. Look at those areas of the hilum. It's because the vessels are there. Remember, all the backlog is causing your vessels to just seep out fluid into your lungs. Uh, and that's why the distribution is completely different. Thank you so much, Stefan. We've just got one final question before yeah. we end it today. Yeah. And it's, what's the difference between a pacification and consolidation? So they are actually the same thing. Um, so when we say a pacification, what we mean is the normal density is not there. So sometimes we use the term consolidation. Sometimes you'll hear people say um, airspace or pacification. They're interchangeable terms, um, but essentially consolidation doesn't actually mean specifically that it's pneumonia. It just means that you, you're not having the right density in your lung. A consolidation could be blood. It could be pus from infection. Uh, or it could be fluid like, uh, like pulmonary edema. So they're, they're just interchangeable terms, but opacification, consolidation, just interchangeable. I would say conventionally people use the term consolidation to mean pneumonia, but strictly speaking, uh, radiologically, that's actually not 100% what it means. It just means that there is increased density in an area where you would not expect it to otherwise be. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you guys for attending the event. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to email.